Hello and welcome to BBC Sussex at 30, a special celebration of your BBC local radio station. I'm Ian Collington. I was a presenter and producer here from 1978 to 1993. And in that year, I made a documentary marking ten years of BBC Sussex and the years leading up to the launch of a county-wide service. It was my pleasure to be invited back to present an updated version of this programme. So please stay with me for the next two hours as we take a trip down memory lane. The forerunner of what is now BBC Sussex was BBC Radio Brighton, which started life in 1968 as a bit of an experiment which they thought might never succeed. The Barrett radio stations had been closed down, National Radio was changing its titles, and here in Brighton, a radio station was born. It came on air a little prematurely because of a blizzard hitting the south coast. It was a brief taste of sounds to come. But there it was then, Radio Brighton on FM only from East Worthing to Peacehaven and inland as far as the Downs. So let's go back to the first official programme. It was a quarter past six in the evening of the 14th of February, 1968. This is BBC Radio Brighton. In the spring of 1774... We reached Brighthelmstone, a disagreeable place. There is scarce an object, either in it or near it, of nature or of art, that strikes the eye with any degree of beauty. The sea will always be a grand object and is generally accompanied with some circumstances of beauty. But here, it is adorned with no rocky shore, nor winding coast, nor any other pleasing accompaniment. Glittering cast for that very first programme. Sir Laurence Olivier, Dame Flora Robson and Dora Bryan. Bright enough today, an illustrated book for 1889. The true pleasure of life, according to Thackeray, is to live with your inferiors. When the real season is on at Brighton, among the real swells who there and then foregather, the majority of us are what we might term pretentious nobodies. We have the summer with us to begin with, and pretentious nobodies as we are, we have the citizens and rabble on our side to end with. But once the opening celebrations were over, it was down to business and time to open the phones for the very first time to our listeners. Hello, BBC Radio Brighton. Can I help you? Yes, Mrs. Holmwood, yes. For just one moment, and I take this down on the teleprinter. Oh, we have a, a message here that's just come through to us. Telephone call, in fact, put through our teleprinter from Mrs. Holmwood of London Road, Brighton. She says the Brighton Bell was also a paddle steamer which went up and down the coast locally between 1923 to 1935. It went as a pleasure boat in the summer. Then it went to Dunkirk as part of the little ship Armada. The first female presenter on the station, Hilda Bamba, setting the style for local radio to come. Mrs Jones now down the road uh, is, is more interested because it's her road that's being dug up and there's a, a row going on about it. It also gives the opportunity, as, as you heard earlier, with the teleprinter and the quiz, if you've got an idea about something or you, you feel cross about something, well, ring up or write in and come in on the programme and say it. The first station manager during that very experimental period was Bob Gunnell, a London radio producer and the only one really prepared to take the risk. A local man from Hove, a former independent councillor, he put a very individual stamp on this fledgling radio station. The whole idea was to cater for all sorts of people with all sorts of different interests. Here were programmes that particular groups could listen to. 
So we had coffee break for women. We had uh, programs which were aimed at people who are interested in the arts, people who are interested in business. There were a lot of specified programs, but we also, you see, um, put in a lot of effort to involve the community with programs like Question Time, it was called, which was like any questions. Radio Brighton was very lucky in its first engineer in charge, Ted Castle, the man who'd actually invented and pioneered the radio car. Well, Ted was given some equipment and told to make a radio station. The most important thing, I think, from our point of view was the fact that we had to build the stations ourselves. The BBC, in fact, sent us a kit of parts, if you like, to build a radio station. And this arrived in a Pantechnicon on November the 14th, 1967. At the, that time, I was just installing the VHF transmitter. I was keeping an eye on electricians and painters and builders and uh, telephone people, all sorts of people in the actual building here. And we had, you know, on top of that lot, to start building all the technical equipment, which we did. And on January the 1st, I was able to hand it over to the programme people to say, there it is, you know, you can play with it and get used to the feel of the controls and so on. And, of course, February the 14th, we were on the air for good. But it was Ted Castle's radio car which was to transform the whole style of broadcasting, not only locally but nationally. It soon got pressed into regular use on Radio Brighton, as Bob Gunnell remembers. What, of course, this did was to enable you to broadcast live from anywhere within the Radio Brighton area. Listeners from those days will probably remember presenters like Joanna Hollis taking the radio car to somebody's front room and just doing the programme at home. And we used to take those programmes out to the audience. A lot of going out to the audience on a Saturday morning, whole programmes would come from the Brighton Open Market. You're in tune with the Coastal Sound, BBC Radio Brighton, where the time is now exactly 12 hours. Time for Keith Slade to say, pleased to meet you. This is where Keith would drop into his more formal guise as a broadcaster and just go out and meet the punters. Right, come on. Any way you like. All goodwill, all free. Hello, madam. I feel you can drive up somewhere, say, in the Brighton Open Market, and create a bit of a happening. Let's all say good morning, Rose, shall we? Good morning, good morning. Rose, just a minute. We've got a bit of a problem on here because the blacks just going to empty the blind. Where do we stand? Under it or under it? <laughs> yes, everybody get back underneath. We're going to empty the blind now. So oh, can't put it in here. <laughs> 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 Subsequently, of course, people learnt how you set up a radio station. But at that time, and particularly as we were the only one in the south, nobody knew really how you went about setting it all up. So uh, these premises were found at the corner of um, Marlborough Place. The thing was, really, I suppose, for each of us with our own particular sphere was to comb the area for all the contacts and find people. We had a lot of auditions at the time to find potential broadcasters. These went on for days and days, I remember, in the little unattended studio that used to be in the Royal Pavilion. Good evening. I want to talk particularly to our senior citizens and other people living alone and to warn you against some despicable men posing as rating officers drain inspectors, roof repairers, bank officials. Into that studio, coming in for bits of auditions, were people who were then employed in other walks of life, um, people like your Des Lynams and so forth. Local radio came blasting into my life at that time, caught hold of it, shook it around a little, and became my hobby. It was only a matter of time, of course, before the hobby interfered with my career, so, naturally enough, I gave up my career and found a whole new one. In early 1968, everything I was asked to do for Radio Brighton used to fill me with terror. Go and interview Fred Bloggs, they would say. Now, that on the face of it would seem a fairly reasonable request. Bloggs was probably the star right winger of a team playing in the Brighton Football League, a gas fitter by trade. What used to happen was that the sight of a microphone would reduce Mr Bloggs, not a verbose man by nature anyway, to a feeble, quaking mess. And what he didn't know was that the very technical nature of handling a tape recorder was something which at that time always created a blind spot in the line and brain. In the radio station's output, there was a whole collection of wonderful events, things which went memorably well. There was also the odd thing which went memorably wrong, like in that very early programme when John Henty was sent to the top of a tower block in Brighton, Sussex Heights to admire the view on behalf of the listeners. 
Yes, well, here I am, right up on the very top of Sussex Heights. It's a very, very windy and a very cold night, too. I have Mr. Richardson, the head porter, with me, and we've got a superb view. At least it would be a superb view if it wasn't quite so misty. But uh, I can see to my left the Palace Pier, and right down in front of me, the West Pier. The lights are dotted along the front, but it's uh, a great shame that it's such a, a misty evening here. I'm told by Mr. Richardson, in fact, that on a clear summer's evening, you can get really superb views right the way back to the Downs. I sometimes joke when I recall those days. Uh, I'm not sure that this is entirely true, and Bob Gunner will probably uh, deny all this. But uh, the meeting we had of the four producers, Keith Slade... There was Hilda Bamber, Mike Matthews, and myself, John Henty. The story I tell, which is partly true, <laughs> is that Bob said, um, right, who's been to the pictures recently? And Keith Slade said, I have. So he said, right, OK, then he said, uh, you can be the arts producer. <laughs> Who has actually uh, presented a record show before, you know, knows a lot about pop music? Mike Matthews had been in New Zealand. He said, I can do that, Bob. Fine, you're in charge of pop music. <laughs> Who's been to a football match recently? Uh, well, I have, uh, Bob. I, I watched Brighton and Hove Albion and Crystal Palace occasionally. Right, you're the sports producer, he said. And that only left one person, who was a woman, so she ended up presenting the women's programmes. Now, Bob may say, what utter nonsense. But there's a fair degree of truth in that. And I was responsible for sport, together with the programme organiser, David Wayne. David went on to very senior things in the BBC. David Wayne had to grapple with the business of getting news into the new Radio Brighton. It didn't have a newsroom to start off with. It used to use a local news agency run by Alan Robson. That was what came in. You then had to make the programmes and the current affairs that followed it. In addition to Alan's bulletins, we have four news magazine programmes throughout the day, two in the early morning, one at lunchtime and one early evening. And my time will be mainly taken up with filling these news magazine programmes. In fact, I shall be pretty well fully stretched to find items which we can follow up, do interviews about, and decide in what way we shall treat the news in the Brighton area on any given day. David Wayne. Well, perhaps because it was such an untried and untested experiment, there was an enormous amount of enthusiasm among the staff. Keith Slade and John Henty remembering just how much work was involved keeping Radio Brighton on the air. My own particular programmes, apart from doing the a shift of presenting the morning programme once a month for a week, and incidentally the afternoon programme for a week, and incidentally the uh, midday news programme, and incidentally the evening news programme as well for a week, was to produce um, the magazine-type programmes to which I'd been assigned, uh, like a half-hour cinema programme, a half-hour arts programme, a half-hour local music programme worth hearing, which ran for all the 20 years of my um, existence there. Very often we would be uh, presenting the evening programme. At one time, I think it was about 10 o'clock at night, we did some news. Then we'd have to put the radio car away in North Road, and then we'd have to uh, go home, in my case, to Shoreham, and uh, we would then have to be up the next morning to do the early show as well. It was that sort of sequence. There were only the four of us, together with, of course, uh, what were known as station assistants. Hello, Arthur. Hello, John. Yeah, we're all clear this time. Oh, no problem. No bus delays or cancellations? No, no, we're all clear this time. Right, oh, Arthur. Thank you very much. Okay. Everybody get together. The growing family of the coastal sound. The technology involved in running a radio station has changed beyond all recognition since those early days. And we'll hear more about that later in the programme. You're listening to BBC Sussex at 30 with me, Ian Collington. And it's impossible to chronicle here the work, the programmes, the people who came and went, the thousands and thousands of people making their first nervous appearance on their BBC local radio station. BBC Radio Brighton, as the forerunner of BBC Sussex, soon established itself as a major player in the life of the local community. The radio car started to be seen at major events. The station also initiated its own proper news operation. The years rolled by, and among those who'd learnt something of their craft at the BBC in Brighton was Kate Adey. She returned to her old training ground, by that stage a regional television reporter, to have a look at BBC Radio Brighton after ten years. 